let me again uh, thank you for uh, asking me along and uh, thank you for coming along uh, on a fairly uh, clever evening uh, to study God's Word together. Uh, we will look at uh, the life of Abraham uh, during those uh, next uh, few months, God willing, and I want to turn tonight to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 12, and the section mainly from uh, verse 1. Uh, to uh, verse 8, to uh, the call of Abraham. Uh, but the story begins, in fact, in Genesis 11, uh, and, uh, at uh, verse 27. So let's pick it up uh, in uh, verse 27 of Genesis 11. Uh, this is the account of Terah. Uh, Terah became the father of Abraham, Nehor, and Haram. And Haram became uh, uh, the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died and out of the Chaldee, Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was uh, the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no children. Uh, Terah took his son Abraham his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ar the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to, to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and the Lord went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran, he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Mori and Shechem, and the Canaanites were with the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and high on the east. Then he built an altar to the Lord, and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. May God bless uh, to us his word. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, in all the main sections of the book of Genesis, uh, there is uh, no main section introduced as the story of Abraham. Uh, that's why I went back to uh, verse 27, chapter 11, because in fact what we have is uh, the account uh, of Terah. And it is within that uh, section of the life of Abraham uh, is actually said. It's a story in a way uh, of his father uh, Terah and of his descendants. Uh, let's remind ourselves uh, of some uh, general features, first of all, uh, of uh, this particular context. Remember how the story begins uh, with the creation of the universe. Uh, we find that in Genesis 1 and again uh, in Genesis 2. And uh, in those chapters, Genesis 1 in particular, uh, the story uh, of what scientists say covered uh, millions and even millions of years uh, is covered in a very, very few verses. And then the story uh, homes in uh, on the human race of Adam and Eve uh, and it's lost down there again, and uh, uh, the pace is much reduced as we have uh, a detailed account, uh, Genesis 1, then Genesis 2, uh, of the creation by God uh, on the first human pair. 
So all this mighty rush to begin with uh, through the cosmogony, the origins of the universe, uh, and then the origins of the human race. Uh, and uh, we have a story that subsequently the fall of the human race in Genesis 3 and a succession of divine judgments passed on the race uh, subsequent to that fall, uh, the expulsion from Eden, uh, the judgment of Cain, the judgment uh, in the flood, uh, all these great moments of judgment. But the narrative is still looking at the race more or less in its universal aspect uh, of what the flood, of course, only Noah's left. But Noah himself is there as representing the race in its entirety. And then it begins to narrow down to the last <coughs> we come to the story of this one man, Abraham. So it's moved from cosmogony to the story of this one individual, this seed of the woman, uh, Abraham. Uh, Abraham uh, and uh, his story. And from that point onwards, uh, having narrowed the story down to Abraham, uh, it will then broaden out uh, down to the New Testament to incorporate the multitude uh, which uh, no man uh, is able to number. So that's the general movement uh, of the story. Now, uh, when we come to the story of Terah and Abraham, uh, let's pause for a moment uh, over to uh, further general points. Uh, first of all, the history uh, and then the geography, because they're both, I think, quite fascinating. Uh, first of all, the history, the historical setting here, the consensus is that uh, Abraham lived uh, around 2000 BC. Now, some of you may be more expert uh, than I in these areas, and you may know that that is. Uh, just a fairly uh, rough generalisation, but uh, it's give and take, uh, give or take perhaps uh, 100 years or something on each side of that particular date, 2000 uh, BC. And uh, we may think, well, that's a very uh, primitive community we're talking about, uh, almost Stone Age savage we're talking about, but uh, bear in mind that uh, by any calculation, uh, there has been civilization uh, on this earth uh, for uh, at least uh, four or five thousand years prior uh, to the arrival uh, of Abraham on the scene. Uh, if we adopt uh, Usher chronology, which is uh, the most conservative, uh, we still have uh, over four thousand years of civilization. <coughs> uh, if we take the view of men like B.B. Warfield and James Orr, uh, 19th century angelical scholars, uh, the human race uh, was there uh, 10,000 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, that gives even more time. So what I'm saying is that uh, we may safely assume that for some 5,000 years prior uh, to Abraham, uh, the race has been uh, on earth and there has been a progression uh, in human civilization. And, uh, especially in this particular area uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, civilization had advanced uh, to considerable levels uh, by this particular uh, period. Uh, we know that there were some very large cities uh, in existence uh, long before Abraham with uh, 200,000 people and sometimes perhaps uh, even more. Uh, they had invented writing we have uh, many tablets which uh, enable us to document uh, various events and various codes uh, going back prior to the time of Abraham. Uh, we know there were ancient trade routes, uh, there was diplomatic activity between the nations uh, of this particular area. Uh, so uh, it was an, an, an age, an area uh, of uh, some sophistication, even uh, in the realm, for example, uh, of art, as we know from. Uh, the pottery uh, and its remains which have been found uh, in these communities. So we are not talking uh, of some uh, primitive Stone Age savage uh, in some very backward community. We're, we're talking here of the, the cradle of civilization uh, and uh, already advanced to a considerable uh, level uh, of sophistication and development. So that's the setting uh, as far as the history goes uh, where some 
five or six years down from the emergence, at least, uh, of Adam and the origin of civilization. Uh, geographically, too, it's important to uh, get the setting right because, in many ways, uh, it is set in a very contemporary context. Uh, the story of Tehran begins uh, in Ur uh, of the Chaldeans. Uh, and uh, Ur, the word Ur itself simply means a city. Uh, but this uh, city uh, is named after the Chaldeans, uh, and the Chaldeans lived uh, in the, uh, the estuary uh, of uh, the confluence of the rivers in Euphrates, uh, the delta of the Euphrates and the Tigris. And uh, you realize that once we're talking really uh, of uh, southern Iraq, uh, and uh, this city of the Chaldees. Uh, is said to have been located uh, somewhere uh, in the region of modern Basra, uh, just to the west of Basra. Uh, there is a fair measure of confidence uh, that a settlement is still there today, uh, since the continuation of this city uh, are the Chaldeans. So we're talking uh, of uh, uh, something set in this geographical area in the delta of the confluence uh, of these two great rivers mentioned, as you recall also uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 2. Uh, to the east uh, of Iraq, of course, we have uh, the huge uh, uh, land of, uh, of Iran, uh, ancient uh, uh, Persia, uh, and then to the west we have uh, modern Jordan uh, and uh, Israel uh, and uh, Palestine. And uh, over the millennia, uh, this has been uh, very much uh, an area of intense activity. Uh, the world's armies and the world's the conflicts and the world's civilizations uh, have all been richly embedded in the soils uh, of those uh, ancient uh, countries uh, so long uh, marked by conflict and by the emergence and disappearance uh, of the emperors of Assyria uh, and of Babylonia and Persia uh, and so on, and then to the southwest of course Egypt, uh, the uh, Euphrates Delta uh, borders the Persian Gulf, uh, and in that sense is far from modern Arabia, uh, which is again uh, an enormous uh, landmass. So it's all in many ways very much part. Uh, of the problem that's so much with us today, the problem of what's now called in the Middle East. Now we see that uh, Terah, the father of Abraham, uh, he leaves uh, out of the Chaldeans. Uh, there is no indication given as to why he did that. Uh, there's no record given to us of any direct divine command that he should do so. Uh, but off he went and uh, he travels. Uh, and he eventually reaches uh, this uh, place uh, which, uh, which he settles in Haran uh, and this uh, takes us into northern Syria. Uh, it's north uh, of Damascus and uh, there they settle. Now uh, that would have been their intention uh, but that's certainly what uh, actually happens. They settle uh, in this land uh, of Haran and in fact, Terah uh, never leaves Haran. It's possible that he left for religious reasons, he left out of the Chaldeans, uh, but by this time, having reached Haran, he had gone far enough. The journey is, I think, about uh, 600 miles uh, along the Euphrates uh, back and then westwards uh, towards uh, this place uh, of Haran. It's again worth uh, pausing over this fact because uh, we are inclined to uh, consider Abraham as a, as a nomad and as a, one of the Bedouin uh, on the move constantly. Now, uh, the signs are quite to the contrary uh, because uh, nomads wouldn't have settled uh, in a place uh, like uh, Haran. And furthermore, the promise of Allah to Abraham it's not a promise which a nomad uh, would be inclined to relish because such people uh, don't like uh, to, to settle and to, to stand still. 
So uh, it looks as if uh, this family uh, were in fact city dwellers. Uh, and when they got to Aran, they felt they had gone far enough, and so they settled uh, in that uh, area. And this brought them back though, to the constant movement uh, that uh, Abraham had to engage in. Uh, it may very well be that this was very much against his own uh, natural grain, as one accustomed to an urban and not a nomadic uh, existence. So we have this movement onwards, as I said, from out of the Chaldeans uh, to northern Syria, uh, and uh, they were settled in Haran. Mm. And that's where Abraham's story begins. Uh, it doesn't begin in out of the Chaldeans as such, uh, it begins in Haran, uh, where they had settled after leaving out of the Chaldeans. So let's pick it up there, uh, the beginning of the story of Abraham. We notice, first of all, with regard to Abraham, that uh, Abraham was the subject or the recipient uh, of very clear divine revelations. Uh, we see that uh, the Lord uh, said to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, and later on, uh, the Lord uh, appeared to Abraham uh, and gives him a renewal uh, of uh, that uh, promise uh, once he uh, travelled through the land. So there is this phenomenon here uh, of God speaking to him uh, and God appearing to Abraham. In fact, uh, he is the first human being uh, with regard to we are told uh, that uh, the Lord or Yahweh did appear to him there. In verse 7 of chapter 12, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, that's the first record we have of a divine appearance uh, to a human being. So these people uh, are in this interactive relationship with God. God is speaking to them and God is appearing uh, to them. Uh, and that means that when they uh, make decisions that act on the basis uh, of any clear revelations of God's will, that leave no room for any degree uh, of uh, uncertainty. Uh, and uh, it's also important to remember that uh, the, the, the absolute confidence that Ben Abraham had uh, in God's existence uh, was not the result uh, of uh, philosophical inference or theistic proof. It was the result of experience. Uh, it was in history that God had spoken uh, and God had shown uh, himself to them. And uh, this special revelation begins very much with Abraham uh, and continues uh, through a seed. And when we see such uh, testing chapters as uh, Genesis 22, the story of uh, Abraham of Lydia Baisak, uh, one key element there is the, the certainty Abraham had that this was God's will because it came to him uh, in this uh, unmistakable way. Uh, so from this point onwards, there is continuous divine self disclosure to Abraham. Uh, to all his descendants, uh, right down to the apostles uh, of uh, the New Testament. And then we notice that uh, God, the Lord, called Abraham. The Lord said to him, leave your country, uh, etc. And there are in fact just uh, uh, two uh, great moments in that call. There is the leave and there is the go. Leave and go. And then he says to him there in, in verse 1, Leave your country, your people and your father's household, and go to the land uh, I will show you. Now, two or three points of that. Uh, notice, first of all, the imperative that he must leave. It reminds us that uh, in all the commitment to the Lord, there is always an element of renunciation, of turning your backs on something. And we find this also in the story of the Lord Jesus calling the early disciples, uh, Peter and John, for example, they're, they're the fishermen, uh, and he says to leave their nets and to follow him the same again with James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they leave their father in the boat and the hired men, and they follow the Lord. Again, Paul, with regard to the Thessalonians, says that uh, they turn to God from idols, always that element uh, of 
turning our backs on something, uh, when we turn our face towards the Lord, uh, this change uh, of direction. <coughs> now I spoke earlier on of the separation uh, that uh, had the narrative for home sin of just this one individual Abraham here. And it looks as if uh, God's purpose is to set this man apart and his descendants and then subject them to a particular destiny and educational process which can be completed and carried on uh, only in the context of separation. Uh, so it could be done in other the Chaldeans and it could be done in Haran because they had to be a part of the influences uh, of those civilizations. And uh, similarly, the whole history of Israel, for example, uh, the, the, the food laws, the kosher laws of the Old Testament, uh, one powerful effect of those laws was that Jews could not socialize with the non-Jewish neighbors uh, because they couldn't eat the food. And that again set them apart. Now we're here in the very infancy of the church, in uh, what Paul would call the minority of the non-age, the child age, the infancy of the church. And in this age, the church, in a way, uh, it needs protection. And so there's a separation going on. Now there's a difficult tension between separation and involvement. But there always has to be some degree of separation, a coming out from the world and a being separate, uh, even to serve uh, the world itself. The salt will lose its saltness unless to some extent it is separated. So here Abraham is told to leave. And see to uh, the emphasis here uh, on, on the personal you, your country, your people, and your father's household. And it's very challenging because he must turn his back uh, on all that's familiar to him and uh, on all that he holds dear. And already he's turned his back on other Chaldeans. Now there is a second renunciation, a second turning back, and you know, he would never see these people again. We know that uh, Abraham's father lived uh, another 60 years after uh, Abraham left Haran. And yet uh, Terah died in Haran without Abraham seeing him again. And there's a poignancy in that, the, the finality of the breach. And again, uh, that same note is done by Jesus, that we must uh, forsake father, mother, brother, sister, and the lambs for my sake of the Gospels. Now, most of us have to do that in a literal way. But when you think of some of those 19th century missionaries uh, who left their own shores to go to uh, far off places to go, uh, to India or to Africa, or perhaps were most challenging of all to go to the Polynesian Islands. These people were going away and they, were, they weren't taking their mobile phones with them. They, they were going off and never again would they see or speak or have any contact with their loved ones. And I just, I blanch what I think uh, of the challenge that those men faced and their wives and families faced and how, what what love for souls they had never seen must have driven them to that tremendous sacrifice. They went, they left. In their own lifetime, uh, people have faced similar challenges. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Cameron here had to go uh, away to a uh, foreign time, perhaps some others as well. And uh, today we can speak to anybody anywhere by pressing a few buttons. It's astonishing. It's such a tremendous privilege God has given us, uh, this communication technology. Uh, but it wasn't like that for these people, or for those missionaries who left their shores. And you may ask, well, what about before the 19th century? Well, we didn't have missionaries before the 19th century. That's part of the sort of thing about church history, that there was only the 19th uh, century that the church is going to become a saint missionaries abroad, that the heathen weren't a problem, uh, or even a burden to us until that a uh, very late era uh, in our uh, church history. But off they went to where you go, God, God said, to turn your back. Leave these things. And we ask whether, well, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's constant emphasis, there is a cost to discipleship. There are things you can't take with you. 
and uh, we must all work out those things for ourselves. Lay aside every weight, lay aside the sins that we say to you, and at the turnstile, this narrow gate, this eye of the needle, you can't take that through the turnstile, sorry, you can't take that with you. Or the, uh, uh, the needle, you can't take a breath with you through this needle, it won't go through. So there is a leaving, a selling to the poor, perhaps for the rich young ruler. So leave your, your everything. At the end of the day, of course, it is the self we deny, the self we leave there, leave, leave you, leave you. And then to allow that will show you. And uh, I don't know whether Abraham said, where is it, Lord? Show me the map. Show it to me on the map. Well, I can have known where it is on the map, but Abraham hadn't a clue where it was. God didn't say to him, it's west, east, north, south. I will show you. And presumably, uh, what happened was, as Abraham journeyed, uh, then it became plain to him a revelation, by divine guidance, uh, which uh, path was to take, no doubt moving along uh, the plain routes, perhaps from uh, northern Syria, going through Damascus, and then uh, uh, coming across and going back uh, across Jordan uh, to he came at last to Shechem. But Allah and I will show you. And they were told that he was in doubt, not knowing where he was going. He didn't know the destination, he didn't know the route. And they were saying every day, Lord, which way today? This tremendous uncertainty uh, that, that he had to cope with. Uh, uh, it's not simply that. Uh, he didn't know what a day might bring, but he, he had no idea to begin with where the journey was going to end, <coughs> or what kind of land or where God was going to take him, but going out, not knowing where he was going. Now, it wouldn't be wise to really spiritualise that too much, because most of us have very clear ideas uh, of uh, where we're heading in terms of responding to God's call. Uh, but there are, there are still elements of comparability that if we reflect on what we thought would be our direction the day we turn to the Lord and how it would all work out for us and how it has in fact worked out for us, how different the reality from the anticipation. Now there may be some for whom uh, the trajectory has been just as they anticipated, but for many of us it has not been. We were not, not knowing. And of course, sometimes we want guarantees. We like people putting their feet on the ice and saying, "Would it hold us up?" And sometimes you don't know till you stand on it. And there's that element always of risk taking. And the Lord doesn't always tell us. Uh, Go back to the principle of the Lord's Prayer, give us today our bread for tomorrow. But what, Lord, about the day after tomorrow? What about next week? He says simply, uh, a land I will show you. And we have to venture forth, even though the, the destination and the route are so unclear, all that's clear is uh, the Lord himself who has called us and the shepherd uh, who was with us. And then we notice the great promise uh, that God uh, makes to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And so it was on down to the end there of verse 3. Now, of course, this is one of the great seminal promises of the, of the Bible and one uh, of which today we as Abraham's seed are still the heirs. And we are here tonight only because uh, God has kept this promise. That's why uh, all of us uh, are here. One or two things again about this, uh, this particular promise. Notice, first of all, the, the prominence of the I word. Uh, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you. I will bless those. And so on. Uh, I will curse. It, none of this is to be uh, simply... Uh, evolution, uh, or accident, uh, or Abraham's own achievement. The whole thing uh, is related to 
divide initiative and to divide activity, I will make you into a great nation. This personal commitment uh, on God's uh, uh, own part. And you know, that again brings in so many elements of unpredictability. You know, at the time of the millennium, when we were all so excited by various things, good and bad, so many of us were tempted to uh, expatiate and to dilate on the church in the next millennium, and the this in the next millennium, and so on and so forth. And we were perhaps a similar one could extrapolate from where we are today to where we'll be in a hundred years' time, that somehow the future is in the past. And there'll be some logical development. It happens to science too. Can you predict where science will be and what new gadgets will have in 25 years' time? And you know, we've all had to realise that these predictions are so absurd. Because God will take us where he wants to take us. I, this great I word. We've seen such amazing things. We've seen, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Empire. There was nothing in 1970 to indicate that that was about to happen or would happen in the next couple of decades. And we've seen the unimaginable horror of 9-11. There was no way you could tell it was going to happen. And if you ask me, where will the church be in 10 years' time? You know, the only honest answer is, I'm the foggiest. But, the, but you still have the same. But look at the figures. <coughs> I look at the church decline, declining here. Look at the church growth rate. I say, can you not build on these statistics? No, I say, because of the I word. I will build my church. And he will take it in his own direction. Of course, you can talk to him about it. And what you say to him has the influence that a prayer will have. But always it will be his church and always it will go the way he wants. God could convert the whole of Scotland before tomorrow morning. No difficulty at all to him. I, this great I word, that's the thing you see. The book of Acts, the things that Jesus continued to do and to teach, Jesus continued to do. So, I, that's what matters. And then this word bless, which again is so prominent in the divine promise here, I will bless you, and uh, I will, you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and so on. And all peoples will be blessed, will be blessed through you. You know, blessing is a very interesting word, and vocabulary in some ways tests us. Uh, some of you may have heard of the moderates of the 18th century in Scotland. They began to become dominant in the church around 1740. And uh, one thing that these people did, they were, uh, in their own view, they were very clever, very scholarly men with philosophical backgrounds. And they changed the vocabulary of, of Scottish preaching. The old preaching of John Ox, the reformers covenant, had been full of Bible words. And these men, they said, well, we've got to find other more modern words, more precise words, philosophical words. And so instead of grace, uh, they had things like virtue and so on and so forth. And a whole vocabulary came into preaching, uh, which, as what my Don Duncan said, uh, was born not in Jerusalem but in Athens. They abandoned the Bible talk about God and to give instead philosophical talk about, uh, about God. Uh, we're always tempted, you know, to find better words and uh, we get maybe embarrassed by those Bible, biblical words. But, you know, this word blessing is very interesting. Uh, ministers today get together and we, just, we discuss things and you say, well, he's not had much success. Oh, he had great success. Uh, or maybe a little uh, less blatantly, uh, great encouragement or great growth or no growth. And it's almost as if we're, we're kind of uncomfortable with the blessing word, with the bless word. The word success doesn't occur in the Bible because uh, success, you see, is the product of human effort. 
You should never succeed in converting souls. You never really have a successful ministry. You may have an encouraging one, but you never have a successful one. Because you plant, you want, depending on your role, but God gives the increase. And God is going to call his own increase success, but bless. And it's quite challenging when you get back to this notion that what we need is the divine blessing, that God will bless what we're doing. And get away from the success idea, this humanistic idea that depends on our own management, our own efforts, our own skill, and so on. Not success, but the divine blessing. So those two general points, the I word here, uh, and the bless, the blessing word uh, as well. And he, he tells Abraham this, first of all, I will make you a great nation. Now, you know, that's pretty banal, in some ways banal, I guess. But remember the circumstances here. Here is a childless couple, and uh, this man is already uh, 75 years old. And God is saying to him, I'll make you a great nation. And Sarah is barren, that she's beyond the age of conceiving children, and God gives this promise. Now, uh, while this, you know, is a ordinary human composition, especially in a way of Western world, we'd have to, we'd have the, the, the news, the guys, we ask them, what's your reaction to this? So the word name was reaction, it's simply a factually, I'll make you a great nation. Surely you would say that, but I'll make you a great nation. You Lord, she's barren, but I'll make you a great nation, God says, the Lord says to Abraham. And the whole nation idea too is interesting. Because they had come there from out of the Chaldeans, so in that sense they were part of a nation. And the nation didn't exist. But you'll be a nation. You know, as some as you see folks say, it's great to be a family again. But that's not the thing here, but to be a nation. A nation, not simply a race, a tribe, you know, part of a nation, like the clan MacLeod, clan whatever, not, not even a clan, not a family of a clan, but a nation. A nation with its own country, that is its own landmass, with its own language, with its own history, with its own culture, that's what I will make you. I will make you a nation, God says to Abraham. Uh, and uh, this, of course, uh, is fulfilled in the literal sense uh, that uh, the Jews, uh, through uh, Jacob, they become a, a separate nation, precisely that. And uh, uh, to this present day, they've got all those attributes, they have a country, they have the language. They, a marvelous job in reinventing the old Hebrew language from the Yiddish of Middle Europe uh, to modern Hebrew. They have their own language, they have their own history, they have their own culture, they are a nation. But then, of course, transcending that, there is the spiritual nation, the seed, the believing seed of Abraham. So, indeed, in two ways, uh, this uh, promise was fulfilled. And uh, you say, well, Abraham became. Uh, all the Jews down through history, and they're all fulfillment of this promise, I'll make you a great nation. But then think of that other nation, that kingdom, not of this world, that Abraham in fact was seeking, the city with foundations. He sought that city, but in that city, a multitude that no one can number, the incalculable seed of Abraham uh, on the spiritual level, I will make your name great. And the promise at that point is absolutely sheerly incredible. I be going to be a nation. I don't even have one child. How can I be a nation? But that's what God says to him. And it's fulfilled not only in one sense, but in two senses, in the physical sense and in the spiritual sense, God makes him. They're a great nation. And I will make your name great. I sort of thought, at first I wouldn't bother raising that point because it doesn't seem so important. But it's extraordinary. 
nevertheless, that going back to 2000 BC, virtually the only name we know from this whole era and from this whole community is that in Abraham. And the others we know about only because of their connections with Abraham. It's interesting to know that people who are famous in their own day and who are completely forgotten. But Mary who broke the who anointed the Lord Jesus with the ointment, she was told that her name would remain immemorial. And uh, we, you think of all the people in Mary's in, in her day were so famous, powerful people in the headlines, and people afraid of them, and people in awe of them, and all forgotten. God makes names great. Of course, the point is that. His name was in the book of life, in the Lamb's book of life. It was engraven on the palm of God's hand. God knew. God singled him out. God noticed him. In some ways, that's the simplest statement of what we mean by election. Election is God noticing people before eternity passed. God noticed him. And God said, I'll make this man famous. I'll make this man great. And uh, he, he will be so, so, so famous and uh, even the Gospels his name crops up time and time again and heaven is defined as being in Abraham's bosom. Such a great name. Heaven is being with Abraham. So great is this man. I will make your name great. And perhaps we ourselves might be a little more patient with the, our own names and we decide to leave uh, our reputations with God. I will make uh, your name uh, great. Uh, leave, just leave it there. And, uh, and then he says, I, you will be a blessing and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now there is a difficulty with the translation of this, and I'm not competent in this Hebrew language to uh, pronounce on it. Uh, that, uh, it may be that it means that uh, in you they will all bless themselves, uh, which uh, Grammatical is, uh, is okay, but I think historically it's quite untenable because people don't all bless themselves by Abraham. Uh, then there is the uh, reflexive that uh, there is the, the passive of that being blessed, they will be blessed through Abraham, uh, or they will find blessing uh, through Abraham. Now, either of those renderings that in Abraham uh, all the nations will find blessing, uh, or by Abraham all the nations will be blessed, either of those translations, I'm told, uh, will do. Now, uh, the point here is that the blessing promised to Abraham was not limited to himself, but through Abraham, through this call, blessings will come to the whole world. You can do two things for that. You can take it backwards and you can take it forwards. Backwards, it goes into the the uh, first gospel word spoken in Genesis 3 when uh, God said to the serpent, the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. And here is the seed of the woman uh, through whom the serpent will be crushed and as a consequence the whole human race uh, is going to be blessed. So uh, Abraham is the bearer of the woman's seed. The other fascinating reference here is the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go make disciples of all nations. And I'm fairly sure that there is an echo in that language uh, of this promise to Abraham. That uh, the promise that God gave to Abraham uh, with respect to all nations will be, will be fulfilled through the gospel preaching uh, of the apostles uh, out of the subsequent uh, Christian uh, centuries. And that means, of course, that part of our encouragement as we begin to preach and to evangelize is that it is covenantal. We are simply moving along the lines that God himself has indicated. God has promised to bless all the nations. Why are you going to these nations, to all those Gentile nations? Why are you going? Because God has said that through Abraham they're going to be blessed. Uh, and uh, there's a reference also in Galatians chapter 3 that's pertinent to this. 
uh, that uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse instead of us, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. The Abrahamic blessing comes through the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And if you ask, well, what was the specific blessing that came uh, through Christ? It is this, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what's happening there? We have the fact that the crucifixion is set in the context of this great promise, that the promise of the Spirit is also set in the context of that promise, and that world mission is set in the context of this Abrahamic promise. Mm -hmm. the, the blessing of the nations is a blessing through Abraham's seed. And the movement towards that blessing began in this <coughs> moment recorded in Genesis chapter 12 in the call of Abraham. All the nations blessed through Abraham uh, and through his seed. And then there's this other side, this more solemn side of things, which I would not be uh, permitted to overlook. Uh, I will, whoever curses you, uh, I will curse. Uh, and uh, that doesn't give me any particular pleasure, I should say, but it is still a reality. You go back again to Genesis, the encounter between God and the serpent. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Uh, well, it, it's not an accident that that enmity is there. We have no, we have, we have no right uh, to uh, make a truce with the world or to have some kind of armistice. I will put enmity. God has put the enmity between the two seeds. And the last analysis, uh, the triumph of the woman's seed involved the destruction of the serpent and of his seed. Uh, so, yes, there is this uh, other risk, this peril that is run by those who curse Abraham and his seed. Now, part of what one has to say there, of course, is that uh, anti Semitism itself uh, runs the risk of coming under the divine anathema. That is, the cursing of Abraham's physical seed but also the cursing of Abraham's spiritual seed, the believers, uh, the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is the divine promise, this I promise, this blessing promise, and this promise that through Abraham all the nations of the earth uh, are going uh, to be blessed. And we as gospel preachers uh, are uh, going out in pursuance of this particular promise and encouraged by it. And then we see Abraham's response. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and the Lord went with him. Now, the, the compliance is interesting, you know. Just as the disciples in Mark chapter 1, for example, or John chapter 1, uh, how when the Lord Jesus calls them, they immediately leave their nets and they follow them. And of course, sometimes there are those of us who want to negotiate with the Lord, uh, when he calls us and uh, we want to say, well, uh, let me bury my dead, or I will hear you at a more convenient season, or I've got this to finish, can you wait a little, uh, so on, or I will go, if I can do this, or take this with, the, with me, and so on. No, he says, he left us the Lord at home. And that means we leave when the Lord tells us that the divine summons, the gospel summons, but looks neither delay nor negotiation, but uh, it requires instant and immediate <coughs> compliance. And I'm interested too in this in Genesis, in chapter verse 4 and chapter 12 here, that Abraham did go alone. A lot went with him. And it took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and the arrived there. I will make you a great nation. And in a way, the nucleus is now there already. Now we have no idea. People reckon perhaps 100, 200 people all together with the servants and so on. Small community. 
But you know, already the, this promise in, in you, all peoples on earth will be blessed. These people, perhaps unwittingly, following the Abraham, are themselves coming under the protection of the Abrahamic promise and the Abrahamic blessing. And they will all be blessed because they are, they are with Abraham. Uh, already he is gathering to himself uh, this community. And it's a reminder to us of some of the kind of neglect in the Western world that uh, faith and following the Lord impacts not only individuals but organisms and communities. This, this whole group is affected uh, by what Abraham has done. So away they go, uh, they, they left Haran. And as I heard from the land of Canaan, and they arrived there, not as the King James Version says, and to the land of Canaan they came. So there they are, they set out. They didn't know at first where they were going to, uh, but they had pointed towards Canaan, and they arrived in Canaan. And uh, they crossed the border into this land of Canaan, uh, and then they moved uh, uh, south uh, a little. Uh, and there they're at Shechem and still at the northern end of the country. Now again, there are some intriguing details here. Note first of all that the Canaanites are in the land. And that is its own point of the sea. Uh, because it's going to be Abraham's land. In fact, uh, God promises them that uh, in verse, uh, there in verse 7, uh, to your offspring, I will give this land, that's God's promise, another promise. Uh, I'll make you a great nation, I'll give you a great name, and I'll bless all the nations through you, and I will give you and your descendants to this land. And the Canaanites are still in the land, and it belongs to them, and there's more than that, because in that ancient world, it was likely as well true, that the land was deemed to belong to the gods of the land. And so the land belonged to the Canaanite gods. It was their land. It wasn't the Abraham's land. What he means to by that? It belonged to the Canaanites. And he always said, you can't give it to me because it belongs to other gods. No, God says it's my land. There, there are other gods worshipped here. But I'm the God of this land, despite all these Canaanite gods. And uh, he is in this uh, culture, in this land with its alien religion, with its own pagan deities, uh, and his own God as said to him. Not only I'll give you this land, but he said to him, This is my land. God is saying, first of all, it's my land. It's God's land before it's Abraham's land. It's God's land, in fact, uh, to give uh, to Abraham. And uh, then we see that uh, in the wake of that particular uh, promise that God has given uh, in verse 8, we see that he pitched his tent. And the Hebrews uh, <coughs> uh, picks up on this and it reminds us that he was a sojourner. He didn't own anything in this country. In fact, to his dying day, all that uh, he owned here was a very plot for Sarah and nothing else. That was all that he had. But he pitched his tent because he wasn't going to stay in the land. It was his land. One day it would be his land and part of the glory of it is the divine schedule. How long it would take uh, for this promise to be fulfilled. And Abraham would never see it. It would never be his land. None of it would be his land. It would take hundreds of years before uh, the, the people of Israel were able to uh, take possession uh, of what was their God uh, given inheritance. And at the moment, all he's got there is a tent. And that's all. He's a soldier, and he is, he's an alien. He's almost an asylum seeker. That's all that he is. And one day, it's all going to be. His or his seeds. <coughs> this combination of possibilities uh, built into the narrative. I will make you a great nation and I'll give you this land. Do you mean, Lord, you give me uh, this plot here? 
I like this field. I mean, you give me this field here. No, I said, I mean, the whole land. It'll all be yours. It'll be yours in perpetuity. I'll give it to you and to your seed. It'll be your land because it's my land. It's God's own land, uh, first and foremost. And then we see this interesting little detail that Abraham then moves right through the land. Uh, from uh, Shechem on the northern border uh, down uh, to the Negev uh, in the southern border. And he traverses the whole distance of north to south. It's a fairly narrow uh, strip of land. But here is Abraham, and no doubt his mind is filled with wonder. You know himself what it is to go uh, and uh, look at a house that perhaps you're thinking of buying. You see this room, but that room, but the guard and the garage, and where is this, where is that, and you dream, and you wonder what it will be like, and you form your own plans, I can do this with this room, but do that with this other room, and so on, so you know what it is. And it's Abraham, and it's got this thought that God has put in his mind, this is all mine, and he goes through from north to south, he sees uh, it was at this time very sparsely populated and undeveloped. He sees its potential, sees its beauty, sees its variable landscapes, its hills, its fields, and so on. From north to south, God takes him through and he sees it. And like Moses, in a way, although he does see it again later on, that's as far as it goes. He sees a promised land. He never inherits it. He has a tent there and a tent here and so on. Night after night, uh, pitching his moving tent. But God lets him see the whole land. Mm -hmm. And not only does he traverse the land, but he also worships in it. He built an altar there to the Lord who had uh, appeared to him. It's quite a feeling in some ways, I suppose, many of you have had it, to a worship to the promised land and the holy land. Uh, and you're conscious of the immense legacies of history and the solemnities of places where you say to yourself, well, Jesus would have seen this, had seen this view from this hill and seen this lake and so on, seen uh, this sunset. And you worship it there in that context. Well, Abraham worshipped there. He never owned it, but he worshipped it. He had this great promise it would be new land. He pitched his tent, he traversed it, and he worshipped. And that was it uh, as far uh, as he was uh, concerned. He sets out towards the Negev in the direction eventually of ancient. Well, there is a story, and even there in the meantime, or I should say, the beginning of the story, the story of Abraham and his seed. It is a remarkable fact to me. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 this uh, arrangement of the book because Genesis is broken up into divisions, uh, each of which begins with an old Hebrew phrase that means these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, Noah, and so on, so what you expect here, these are the generations of, of Abel, but no, the generations of Terah. And the story, that, the, the, this particular uh, set of told of, of, of generations, the glory of it is that the story is, is not yet finished. It begins here, the call of Abel. But it's still going on, the ongoing story of Abraham uh, and his seed. And I suppose that, like me, none of you feel particularly Semitic. We don't feel very near Eastern or Middle Eastern in our own psychologies. And yet we are Abraham's seed. We are his spiritual children. We are heirs of his promises. The story begun in Abraham has been continued in and through. Uh, ourselves, and we'll pick it up again uh, <coughs> next uh, next month. If there are points you want to raise or to enlighten me on, I'll be very happy indeed to listen uh, to anything that you would like to uh, put to me.